our Father in heaven. It's a great joy to be here this morning. What a privilege it is to be able to, to share your word with your people. And Father, I pray this morning that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in a mighty way. And we thank you ahead of time for sending your spirit and your angels to be engulfed around this sanctuary. That as we come together and we learn of you, that you'll speak specifically to each individual heart. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay. Have you ever heard the term flat on your back? You know, I looked up the definition, and it means to have no ability or strength to stand. You may have heard someone in past that may have said, you know, I've had the flu and I've been flat on my back all week. You've heard that before. And the question that I challenge each of us with this morning is, are we spiritually flat on our back? Or do we not have the strength to stand? Do we not have the strength to sit up? Because when I think of sitting up, when you sit up, and as I was laying there, I couldn't see you. I couldn't see out the window. My perspective on things around me was limited. But when I stood up, and when I sat up, excuse me, I took notice of what's around me. Now I see your faces. Now I recognize what's going on outdoors. You know, the winds, the trees are swaying, the partly cloudy. You have an awareness of what's around you. But what's more important, and I believe God is asking this of each one of us, in the times in which we live right now, he is asking us to stand up. To stand up and be ready to go when he calls us. Myself, and I can believe that many of you have been challenged with the spiritual challenge of being flat on your back for way too long. So will you accept the challenge today to take a stand? To sit up and recognize, as my sister said just a few minutes ago, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. But do you really believe it? In your heart, do you sense God speaking to you every day that he wants to come and he wants us to take a stand for him and to be ready to meet him when he comes? I have someone's cell phone here. I'm going to set it over here. If I get a call, do you want me to answer it? I entitled this sermon for a couple reasons, and, I'll, and you'll find, figure that out as we move forward. Single-minded loyalty. And we'll get a chance to understand what that means. So, as I was going through the scriptures, and as I have for many years, I was thinking about the prophets and the prophetess. And as I read about these different characters that God has chosen throughout the years you know what I found that seemed to be a common thread through each one of their lives God usually called them for one purpose and you know what that one purpose is someone anyone what is the one purpose that God called the prophets for to give a message a warning to the people that doom was coming upon them if they didn't make a choice right a good choice we have the full extent of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. We know what's ahead of us. So when I look at their lives, it sort of brought me to a decision to look closely at what does this single-minded loyalty mean for us? Does God have a purpose for us to do a thousand things? Does God have a purpose for our lives to do a hundred different things? How about even ten things? I believe that God has a purpose for your life to do one thing great for the kingdom of God. He's not asking too much of us, brothers and sisters. He wants us to be committed to him with an open heart. So it caught my mind, and I, and I thought about this, and I wanted to encourage you moving forward is to ask God right now, and if you don't know what it is, and as you're laying on your back tonight in bed and it's quiet, lay there in prayer and ask God, or get up on your knees and pray, Lord, what is my one single-minded 
loyalty that I need to have to be actively involved in ministry. Does that mean that I have to pe preach the prophecy series? Well, if he's called you to do that, I'll step aside. Is it that he wants you to pray for this series? And I thank you, sister, for sharing that. I'll know that we'll be praying for the series and you'll be praying for me in preparation for this in September. Or does he want you to go door to door? Does he want you to invite a family member? Does he want you to minister? What is it that God has for you? Don't feel any one of you that you don't have an ability to do something for the kingdom because you do. I'm convinced that God has one thing that you will do well. And if he chooses to give you more abilities and strength, he'll do that. But he's asking you right now, moving forward to September, to be engaged with that ability that he's put on your heart. So think about it as we're moving forward this, this morning. So what does it mean <clears throat> to be dedicated? It's a person that is devoted to a task or a purpose. And I said it before, I got my title from this definition. It means, in short, single-minded loyalty to be totally focused on one thing that God has for you. So that's not too difficult, is it? I think he can do that in your life, and he will do that. And I was thinking, okay, God, what is it for me? And I began thinking about what God did for, his, for us. What was his single-minded loyalty? It was to reconcile you and I back to him in a perfect relationship, right? And how did he do that? He gave his son on Calvary for us. That he died for our sins. That we might be saved for eternity. What a commitment. So what is that one thing God has called you to do? To save a soul for his eternal kingdom. He's not asking too much, folks. Just one thing. Just one thing. So how do you build single-minded loyalty? And, I, and Debbie sometimes gets after me because... I'll have these lists of four things or ten things. Well, I'm not going to tell you how many this morning, but I want you to listen. And I want you to ask yourself the question, how many of these really fit me as a person in how I live, how I work, and how I act? So are you ready? Let's get started identifying what a single-minded, loyal person may look like if you were to observe them. And then we're going to move into some Bible verses, what the Bible tells us also that defines that person like you. So here's the first one. If you observe someone that doesn't make excuses, that's someone with single-minded loyalty. Listen to this one. If you know someone or observe someone with a, an infectious compassion to do the work, you know there's something good there. Have you ever met someone like that that just loves their job and they're just full of zeal? If you haven't, we got a lot of work to do because the church should be full of people like that. We should be so excited about getting ready for this series and for Jesus to come. We're going to have this infectious compassion. But the next one, it says that we need to be positive. How many of you can say that every day you have a positive attitude? Wow, I love it. I love it. So we want you on the front lines of this team, folks, moving forward. Because we need positive people. You know, positive people definitely make you feel good, don't they? So let's go on with this list. How many of these are fitting into your, your style of being someone that's dedicated? How about someone that's punctual? Not just sometimes, but all the time. And don't be looking at your spouses. Because we're all guilty of this sometime or another. <clears throat> The other one, how about high intent attendance or low absentee? Being here at church, being here at prayer meeting, being a part of the seminar planning coming up, being a part of that. These are individuals that show a characteristic of being dedicated. How many of these so far has fit you? Let's go down the list, a few more. This will be interesting. And I know that the leadership here have these things memorized. How many of you know the mission and the vision of the South Flint Church and understand the whole values built behind that? I know the head elder has it memorized. I know the deaconess know this. I know the members know this. Oftentimes we write these mission and vision and these values for our church and we send our plan up to the conference. But how often do we stay on plan to be dedicated 
you must, you must be committed and understand your mission and your vision for your church. And our mission is very simple for September. You know what it is? What is it? Say it louder. Invite, invite people to this church that they may know Jesus Christ for their personal Savior. It's pretty simple. A couple more. You've got to be flexible. You have to have a high work ethic. And you know, a person that's dedicated, you know that the work's going to get done. Don't you love people that are that motivated that you know if you give them a task, that, that job's going to get done, you don't have anything to worry about. So those are the people that God are working with. I keep finding things up here on the desk. I'll just keep moving them. <clears throat> so what does the Bible say about being dedicated? Listen to this. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, you sacrifice. Being a part of any commitment requires sacrifice. It might be a little sacrifice or it might, might be a large amount of sacrifice. In Colossians 3, 17, it says that you've got to give thanks to God. We must give thanks to God. To be dedicated, it says in 1 Peter 1, 3, prepare your minds for action and be sober. Prepare your minds and your hearts today. In Romans 14, 8, it says to work heartily. Psalms 32, 8, count it all joy when you meet various kinds of troubles. God's people don't turn away when the going gets rough, Right? You keep persevering, and the blessings come. And then lastly, well, actually two more, teachable. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says to be teachable. How teachable are you? And then lastly, it says, and most importantly in Jeremiah nineteen thirteen, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with what? All your heart. God wants all your heart today. God wants to create in you that clean heart. He wants to make known to you that he is alive. And when you know personally in your heart that he's alive, you will then be motivated to that one calling that he has for you to engage in his ministries. So, when a person is dedicated, that person is committed. When a person is committed, that person is devoted. When that person is devoted, I believe that person is steadfast, but more than that, that person is true. Let's be true to our faith. God hasn't called us here to sit and wait for his coming. God has called us here to engage, to be active in his work, that we're all a mouthpiece, we're all hands, we're all eyes, everything on deck, ready to go to serve others so that they can be a part of his calling, of his last day people, friends. I don't know how to say it other than to sit up and to take some action. This church should be full, shouldn't it? Every one of you, if you applied the one gift God gave you, every one of you, every day, this message would just fill this community. We need to be purposed in heart daily that God has called us to a great, great task. And that is to call those out that are lost and that we can be a part of the plan of their salvation, that we can embrace that. So, Lord, the Lord God is calling my heart. Is he calling your heart today? I pray that he is. I pray that he is. Our Bible verse reading today. Let's go to it again in Psalms 51. Psalms 51 verses 10 through 12. Psalms 51. <clears throat> All right, do we have it? Psalms 51, 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right or a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with your generous spirit. Isn't that a wonderful verse? What an encouraging verse. That God wants to restore in us a clean heart and to prepare us. Two stories about two individuals that I feel that are, were very dedicated and understood the purpose 
of being single-minded loyal. This was uh, G.J. Letourneau. He was born in 1888. He passed away in 1969. He was an inventor of earth-moving equipment. He had over 100 patents, and he had over 300 different designs of earth-moving equipment. And you know what his prayer was? He said, Lord, I want to be a businessman for you. And you know what his single-minded purpose was? Was to give all most all his finances back to the work of God. He gave 90% of all his earnings back to the work of God. I've shared tithing with people sometime, and they told me they, hey, they can't give 10%. And this message is not about tithing this morning. I'm just telling you about when you're dedicated to something, you're going to give it all. And I love this quote. Let me read what he says. He says, um, here it is. I shovel out the money, and God shovels it back, but God has a bigger shovel. <laughs> Isn't that true? Wow, why do, we ever, why do we ever challenge God on these issues of finances? Why don't we just have the faith to know that he will return it? If our focus is to primarily do his work, and if we're about his business, all things are possible, and if we prayerfully commit to filling this church, God will fill this church with souls. But if we fill this church, we must be committed to mentor those new members coming into this church. We need to sacrifice our time, and we need to sacrifice our resources. Whatever it means is to build up this church so that we may someday soon have to build another church. It's about spreading the gospel. It's not about just maintaining. It's about growing God's church. God wants to grow his church, and he will grow his church. The second story I wanted to share with you is a, is a man, and you know him, he's in the scriptures, Jeremiah. He was 20 years old when God came to him and wanted him to be a spokesman. And here is a young man that was going out onto the streets preaching the righteousness by faith message calling people from their sinful ways. How easy it would, would it be for you when you were 20 years? Well, I don't even say 20. How easy it would it be for you today if God called you out onto the streets to preach the righteousness by faith message? Overcoming the sins of this world, living a victorious life, turn from your evil ways, come back to God, give your full heart to God. Would you be able to do it? You would. And you know why? Because it's not your strength. And we've talked about this a million times. It's his strength living through us. He can do all things through us, folks. That's why he will fill this church, and hearts will be changed. And it goes on to tell them the story of Jeremiah. He stood between, before these nations in unparalleled apostasy. He talked about the downfill, downfall of the house of David and the fall of Solomon's temple. But you know what's interesting about this prophet? It tells us that he witnessed his own prophecies of impending doom upon his people. We know the message, friends. We know what's ahead of us. Do we? Do we know what's ahead of us? We'll find out more if you haven't been studying it lately in the prophecy series. But there's something that's coming upon this land and around this world very soon that we need to be prepared for. And I want to be prepared for. So Jeremiah and Lortorno were dedicated, committed, devoted, loyal, steadfast, and true. They had no excuses. These two men were committed, friends, totally committed to God's work. Once again, I define what it means to be dedicated, and it means to do what? I only asked for 32 minutes. Single-minded loyalty to a purpose that God has called you to. Do you know what it is yet? Do you know what God has called you to? Well, I'm going to turn this table a little bit here and put it back on the church here because the church is going to preach the sermon for the next three minutes. I had asked the leadership here at the church that they would send me a definition of of what it means to be dedicated. <clears throat> and I love the responses. 
I love the responses because I know that first night I'm up here that I'm working with a group of people that are dedicated to the commission of the gospel. Let me read what they said. I won't put any names with it. Leadership's response on the definition of what it means to be dedicated. To show loyalty in thought and action in a consistent manner. If we're consistent, we will not fail. Listen to the next one. Wholeheartedly give myself to a very important mission and seeing it through to the end. Wow. Seeing it through the end. I have no fears now. Not only are we committed and want to be consistent, but we're going to see it through to the end. That takes the pressure off me already. Listen to the next one. This comes from your leadership. Being dedicated means that the one has decided to give their time and ability to serving a person or a cause they believe in and not to another. They believe in it. The ability to serve a person, to serve a cause. Are you service-minded? This tells me that you are. Not only are you consistent, but you're wholeheartedly searching to the end, but you have a personal cause. And here's the next one, two more. What dedication means to me, gratefully choosing to set apart with a surrendered heart to God that his character and sacred purposes will be achieved in my life solely to his glory. Amen. And the last one, I saved this. It's one, two, three, four words. Being committed to God. Friends, being committed to God. If you're committed to God, how can you fail? You won't fail. God wants a committed people dedicated to his work. What an aspiration for the South Flint Church to have a people that understand what it means to be dedicated. I thought of this verse in 1 Peter 2.9. It says, But ye are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you see his light today? Do you sense it in your life? Do you have that eternal peace that passes all understanding? Friends, what is dedicated to God, it will last. I believe it. It will last. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the South Flint Church. The South Flint Church. So, <clears throat> if 50 years from now we were to look back at this day, this church, 2019, in the month of May, would they see the start of a great reformation in this community? I'm hoping and pray that they do. Believe me, I've been up on this pulpit many times over the past 38 years, and I've always in my heart prayed for this. I've always in my heart preached this. But one day, one day it will happen that God will have a reformation in his church. People's lives will be changed. We won't even have enough room to seat these people in September. That is not a pipe dream. That's a reality. When the Spirit is poured out and the people of God are committed, you will see this. And that's going to be my prayer. That God will create in us a clean heart and that we'll have a clear vision of what he'll have for my life specifically to make this a successful ministry in the community here in this part of Flint. So pray with me, friends, that God will do that for us. So that'll be our history here in South Flint. We won't be here 50 years if we, we have this success. God will be here soon, and I'm looking forward to that. But let's take a minute. I want to take you back in history for a minute. And this was fascinating when I read through this. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? How many of you studied that recently? Not many of us. <clears throat> Amen. We got one out there. So <clears throat> these 56 men who signed the declaration, five were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve of their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons serving in the Revolution Army. 
Another had two sons captured. But listen to this as it goes on. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds and hardship of the Revolutionary War. They signed their pledge, their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. They were dedicated to a cause, friends, so that we could have freedom today. Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross so that we could have freedom today. What kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants, 9 were farmers and plantation owners, men of means, well-educated, but they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Are you willing to sacrifice all the way up to possibly losing your life for Jesus? You don't have to answer that today, but maybe you do. Where are you at in your walk with Jesus? Are you dedicated to the point that these men and women, these families were? But let me read on a little further because it gets more heartbreaking. But before I do that, Romans 14, 8 says, For we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So you don't lose. So... Carter Claxon of Virginia, a wealthy plantation and trader, saw his ship swept from the sea. It was swept from the sea by the British Navy. He had to sell his product, his property and everything they owned to get out of debt. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family constantly. Francis Lewis had his home and property destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife. And she died a few months later. They didn't have to do this, did they? They didn't have to do this. But listen to this. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His field and his gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year he lived in the forest and he lived in caves. And returning home to find that his wife is dead and all of his children vanished. And he died two months later. What does it take to be a person of this character? Why would you give your life for something? Do you know why? Because they believed in it. They believed that freedom was more important than life. Do you believe that the lost souls out there are more important than being comfortable? Are you willing to sacrifice the way that these Founders of this nation sacrificed the way that our Jesus sacrificed on the car. And I'm not comparing these two by no means. Because Jesus paid the ultimate price that we may live. These were not wide-eyed, rabble-rousing individuals. They were soft-spoken men and means and had means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight and unwavering. They adopted a firm position for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Wow. That's dedication, friends. So these families gave their freedom of being free for independence. Many of them made sacrifices. These Americans risked everything and stood to be counted. So I ask you, take a few minutes each day and see what you're sacrificing. I know I, I need to revisit this more often. Just remember that freedom never comes without a cost. So returning back to the South Flint Church, are we going to be able to write that history? Are we going to have that type of investment, being willing to sacrifice all for the souls of this community? I ask myself. God wants us to have that clean heart. He wants us to, to have success in our churches. Joshua told us this. These are, and just in some closing statements, that Joshua has told his people on this day, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers serve, they were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, 
in whose lands ye dwell. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and the voice we will obey. Do you hear his voice? Don't hear Mike's voice. Hear his voice. God is calling you. He called you to this church for a reason. He called you to this church to be a part of this last great message that needs to go out to the world. So, a quick few points here. So, what does it require to be dedicated? How's your determination? Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing, one thing he said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for those things which are before us. Friends, determination. Let's be determined this time. Forget what has happened in the past, but let's reach forward and let's have success in September. God will bless our efforts. Number two, the, personal, the person that's dedicated, you need to be disciplined. If you're not disciplined, let's get disciplined to do his work. Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after what? The Spirit. Number three, to be personally dedicated requires a devotion to God. How's your devotional life? I can't survive unless I have a devotional life. And then number four, the person who is dedicated, you have to understand what it means to discriminate between what is good and what is evil. In Hebrews it says, we as Christians must set our minds on the things above. A little while ago I said, I was talking about getting ready and having a change and filling the church. And as I looked across the congregation, I saw a few smiles out there. So when I see smiles like that following a statement, I believe that you believe that it's a reality. It's a reality because I look beyond this world and look at the world to come. What a place that'll be. Why do we love this world so much? I love this world so much because I have an opportunity to be a voice for Jesus Christ. Just this morning, driving in the church. God is so good. He puts people in our ways constantly. We're on this gravel road coming in from Fenton. And I saw this lady, and I've seen her there a couple times walking her dog. I said, Deb, I have a couple books in the side of my door there. Let's stop and talk to her. She said, okay. Deb's always willing when you're doing ministry. So we stopped, and we rolled the window down, and we began. To, she looked at us first like, who are these people? Because you never know who's going to stop. And we introduced us ourselves as we're, we live on this street. We're just up the road here. And she goes, oh, I know where that is. And we had this wonderful conversation together. And Deb, you're not going to believe it, but I remember her name. It's Jenny. Did I get it right? Jenny. So Jenny is saying, you know, come by. We, have, we do our own organic honey and that, and we like to give our neighbors a welcoming gift. And we'd like you to come by for a jar of honey. And I'm thinking, boy. She doesn't know who she invited to her house. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this because that was a divine appointment. And so we pulled the book out, and Deb said to her, we have this, this gift for you. We think you'll really, really enjoy the gift, and it was the story of hope. And she says, oh, I'm a Christian, and oh, we're Christians. And Debbie, we, somehow we talked about homeschooling. And she says, oh, we homeschooled our kids. And so we had a little conversation on the side of the road, but God will lead you to people if you ask. So my point here is for the next three months, ask who you're going to bring to the meeting. Every one of you. There's 50 people here today. We should have 100 people in this room. We can shoot higher, but let's start with 100 people. John 14, 4, or 4, 14 says, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be in him a fountain of water springing up in everlasting life. Wow. Matthew 16, it tells us, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me, he says. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, we'll find it. 
For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, I think I went over the 32 minutes. Can I have a couple more minutes? <laughs> I didn't tell you that <laughs> the last time I did it, I think I almost did it the, the, the last time I presented, but you know, the Lord moves on your heart in different ways, and sometimes you have to share stuff that's outside of what you prepare because that's what the, the elders prayed for, that the Holy Spirit would speak through Mike, and I'm believing that, okay? I'm just not up here just sharing because I like to talk because ask Debbie, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up this way and I know my daughter-in-law won't believe me, but <laughs> there, were, there was a time that I wouldn't even stand up here. or I was more recluse. But when it's doing the work for God and he puts something on your heart, you have to share it. So I have a couple more points. Just give me a few extra minutes, okay? All right. This, this, was, this is pretty good. You know, I, I, I was reading something last week. You all know who uh, George Washington Carver is, an American agriculturist and inventor? And he said this. And I almost want to change it, but I won't. But I'm going to. He says 99%, but I'm going to say 100%. But I know why he used 99% because I'll often do that too because you're really saying, you know, I'm going to give that 1% that option. 99% of the failures come from people who have the habits of making what? Excuses. The parable of the Great Supper. It's found in Luke 14. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and he set his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make what? Excuses. The first one said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask that you excuse me. Another one said, I have bought five yoke and oxen, and I'm going to have to test them. I ask that you would be excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Excuses. When will those excuses run out? A list of excuses that I want you to eliminate from your life and your vocabulary these next three months. Let's just have a change here for the next three months and moving forward during this series. Now, if any of these fit you, let them go. Here you go. Here's the list. Excuses that you're probably familiar with. You never told me you needed that. I didn't understand. I forgot. You never do that stuff I ask you to do either. Sort of shifting the blame maneuver. You ever hear that one? I don't know how to do it. So-and-so told me I didn't need to do it. You could have done it yourself. Boy, that hurts. Nobody else has to do that. That's not my job. And then the last one. Don't make this promise unless you're sincere moving forward here in this series. I promise I'll do it today. And after that I wrote, will you? Do you promise and purpose in your heart to be single-minded, loyal to God? That we can get this work done and go home? That's my heart's desire. I preach, and when I preach and when I share... My heart's desire is that people will see Jesus the way that I have found him when I have seen him. And you'll have your own personal experience. But he changed my life. He gives me joy. He opens my mind to different things that I never ever thought of. But when you're open to the Holy Spirit and you allow him to use you, you'll see things differently. So my prayer is, friends, is that we'll sit up, like I did earlier at the beginning of the service. Sit up and take notice. Take notice of what's going on around you. It's only a matter of time before Jesus comes. I don't have the clock, but I'm praying that it'll be soon. But when you take notice, take a stand. No more excuses. None of those. No more. There's no more excuses. I am purpose, Lord, 
to do what you have called me to do, and I start today, you'll see wonderful things happen. And God will send people to this church. My last verse is this. In Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set over you much. Enter into the joy of your master. Friends, those are the words that I want to hear. I wanted to close with a song. A song really defines everything that I've talked about here today. I may have, I think on the spur of a moment, you asked me to do a song once and I did part of it, but I want to sing this song to you because it means so much to me. And you know, you can sing this verse over and over again, but until you have this experience, until you ask God, you won't understand some of the things that I've shared with you today. So let me share this song with you in closing. Is one, are one of these mics on up here? That'll, that'll work. <clears throat> Oops. Boy, that would be a disaster if I did that. Let's put that. Can you hear the guitar okay? Mm. Change my heart, oh God Make it ever true Change my heart, oh God May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Amen. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. <clears throat> I did change the order of service a little bit by doing a closing song, special music. So let's take our hymnals. Turn to 86, How Great Thou Art. 